Hi everybody. So we are back and we're going to continue our journey with Edward. We'll be on his journey with him as we follow him. And um, I'm holding this up so that it's a cue for me on my videos when I know how to put them up on YouTube. And we know that's the bookmark for Edward, the proper rabbit, the gentleman rabbit. So boys and girls, I hope you have your sequencing uh, storyboard there ready and a pencil and ready to go. And remember, you can always pause the video, stop it, learn from mom or dad and how to stop it so you can write down the character names. And I'll try to spell them out this time. Um, thank you, I've been reading some good work on answering the questions from Edward Tulane last week. So um, good work. So let's carry on, have your sequencing board ready. You can pause it now, go get it if you don't have it. And we'll be ready to start, okay? Good, all right, so we're all ready to go. And we last left Edward, um, he was face up on a hill somewhere, rolling down and down and down. He had just been kicked off the train from um, where, let's see, it was Bull and Lucy, right? And it was Malone, the rabbit, was kicked out of the, the uh, train car. All right, so now here we are, Malone, back to Edward thinking, and the last thing he said was he wondered how many times he would have to leave without getting the chance to say goodbye. That's pretty, pretty sad for him. He's really opening his heart. He's learning how to love. So we're pretty happy for him. Let's see what his next adventure is. It's always exciting, okay? Chapter 15. Make sure you write that on your sequencing board. If you run out of sequencing papers, just make up another, it's usually, it's computer paper. So if mom and dad have that or a white piece of paper and just etch out the grids, okay, the squares that are on there and make your own sequencing storyboard, okay? You can do that. All right, chapter 15. Hmm, what do you notice there? Oh, I see the sky, I see a crow. And I see the crow standing on a tall, empty pole, I guess. Hmm. Where are we going? Let's find out. In the morning, the sun rose and the cricket song gave way to bird song. And an old woman came walking down the dirt road and tripped right over Edward. Humph, she said. She pushed at Edward with her fishing pole. Looks like a rabbit, she said, and she put down her basket and bent and stared at Edward. Only he ain't real. She stood back up. Harumph, she said again, and she rubbed her back. What I say is there's a use for everything, and everything has its use. That's what I say. Edward didn't care what she said. The terrible ache he had felt the night before had gone away and had been replaced with a different feeling, one of hollowness and despair. Pick me up, or don't pick me up, the rabbit thought. It makes no difference to me. So that's very different for Edward to think that way. But the old lady picked him up. She bent him double and put him in her basket, which smelled like weeds and fish, and then she kept walking, swinging the basket and singing, Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. That's an old song. Edward, in spite of himself, listened. I've seen troubles too, he thought. You bet I have, and apparently they aren't over yet. Edward was right. His troubles were not over. The old woman found a use for him. She hung him from a pole in her vegetable garden. She nailed his velvet ears to the wooden pole and spread his arms out as if he were flying and attached his paws to the pole by wrapping pieces of wire around them. In addition to Edward, pie tins hung from the pole. They clinked and clanked and shone in the morning sun. Ain't a doubt in my mind that you can scare them off, the old lady said. Scare who off, Edward wondered. Birds, he soon discovered. Crows, they came flying at him, cawing and screeching, wheeling over his head, diving at his ears. Go on, Clyde, said the woman, and she clapped her hands. You gotta act ferocious. Clyde, 
Edward felt a weariness so intense wash over him that he thought he might actually be able to sigh aloud. Would the world never tire of calling him by the wrong name? So now we know a new name for him. It's Clyde. Let's spell it C-L-Y-D-E. Clyde, that's his new name. The old woman clapped her hands again. Get to work, Clyde, she said. Scare them birds off. And then she walked away from him out of the garden and towards her small house. The birds were insistent. They flew around his head. They tugged at the loose threads in his sweater. One large crow in particular would not leave the rabbit alone. He perched on the pole and screamed a dark message in Edward's left ear. Caw! 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 Without stopping. As the sun rose higher and shone meaner and brighter, Edward became somewhat dazed. He mistook the large crow for Pellegrina. Go ahead, he thought. Turn me into a warthog if you want. I don't care. I am done with caring. Caw, caw, said the Pellegrina crow. Finally, the sun set and the birds flew away. And Edward hung by his velvet ears and looked up at the night sky. He saw the stars. But for the first time in his life, he looked at them and felt no comfort. Instead, he felt mocked. You are down there all alone, the stars seemed to say to him. And we are up here in our constellations together. I have been loved, Edward told the stars. So here is a picture of Edward as he was posted onto the pole to be a scarecrow. See the pie tins there that the old lady attached? So they'd be metal and they would be clanging and that would supposed to scare away the birds. So we've all seen scarecrows around uh, gardens and large farmer places in the fields. It's so that the scarecrows don't eat all the seeds and uh, which we're growing right now in our science. So uh, we wouldn't want to have a scarecrow come down and pick away our seeds, right? So that's the, uh, the use of him as the old lady found. And there's the stars at night. So he's always looking at the stars at night, isn't he? but he knows he's been loved. So what, said the stars, what difference does that make when you're all alone now? Edward could think of no answer to that question. Eventually the sky lightened and the stars disappeared one by one and the birds returned and the old woman came back to the garden. This time she brought a boy with her. End of chapter 15. Hmm. A boy coming to where Edward is. Let's see what happens there. So chapter 16. Write that down now. We're coming up to chapter 16. There we are. There's the boy. Let's take a good look. He's got something in his hands. I wonder what that is. So we know that he's in a big garden of some kind. And so the old lady brought a young little boy. He's got some kind of tool with him. It's an old-fashioned hoe for the garden for picking up um, probably let's see maybe the weeds in the garden remember this story is being told like a hundred years ago so this little boy has older style clothes on he looks a bit dirty a little bit sad well let's see what happens about this so chapter 16 hey Bryce said the old woman Get away from that rabbit. I ain't paying you to stand and stare. Now remember, this book travels around um, the, the country, and this time they're in the back country, where their grammar in speaking isn't as nice as it is here. And so you're going to hear me read like that, like get away from that rabbit. Really, it's get away, but the author is using get away. Yes, I'm, said Bryce. He wiped his nose with the back of his hand and continued to look up at Edward. The boy's eyes were brown with flecks of gold shining in them. Hey, he whispered to Edward. And a crow settled on Edward's head and the boy flapped his arms and shouted, Go on, git! And the bird spread his wings and flew away. Bryce, shouted the old woman. Ma'am, said Bryce. Get away from that rabbit. Do your work. I ain't gonna say it again. Yes, um, said Bryce, and he wiped his hand across his nose. I'll be back to get you, he said to Edward. The rabbit spent the day hanging by his ears, 
baking in the hot sun, watching the old woman and Bryce weed and hoe the garden. Whenever the woman wasn't looking, Bryce raised his hand and waved. The bird circled over Edward's head, laughing at him. What was it like to have wings? Edward wondered. If he had had wings when he was tossed overboard, he would not have sunk to the bottom of the sea. Instead, he would have flown in the opposite direction, up into the deep, bright blue sky. And when Lolly took him to the dump, he would have flown out of that garbage and followed her and landed on her head, holding on with his sharp claws. And on the train, when the man kicked him, Edward would not have fallen to the ground. Instead, he would have risen up and sat on top of the train and laughed at the man. Ka ka ka. In the late afternoon, Bryce and the old lady left the field. Bryce winked at Edward as he walked past him. One of the crows landed on Edward's shoulder and tapped with his beak at Edward's china face, reminding the rabbit with each tap that he had no wings, that not only could he not fly, he could not move on his own at all in any way. Dusk descended over the field, and then came true dark. A whippoorwill sang out over and over, whippoorwill, whippoorwill. It was the saddest sound Edward had ever heard. And then came another song, the hum of a harmonica. It was Bryce. He stepped out of the shadows. Hey, he said to Edward. And then he wiped his nose with the back of his hand, and then played another bit of song on the harmonica. I bet you didn't think I'd come back, but here I am, I come to save you. Too late, thought Edward as Bryce climbed the pole and worked at the wires that were tied around his wrists. I'm nothing but a hollow rabbit. Too late, thought Edward as Bryce pulled the nails out of his ears. I am only a doll made of china. But when the last nail was out and he fell forward into Bryce's arms, the rabbit felt a rush of relief and the feeling of relief was followed by one of joy. Perhaps, he thought, it is not too late after all for me to be saved. That's the end of that chapter. So the next chapter, and our last chapter for this portion, is chapter 17. Hmm. So now we know of Bryce, a new character. Oh, I'll spell that for you. Capital B-R-Y-C-E, Bryce. So that's the new character, and you saw the picture of him. So here's an interesting picture. That looks like a really old shack of some kind. Does it look like a house? Nothing we know about, that's for sure. But in where this book is taking place, remember, it's about 100 years ago. And um, this is where Bryce lives, actually. And it is an old shack. It's in very poor disrepair. And uh, we're going to find out about Bryce and his life there. So chapter 17, Bryce slung Edward over his shoulder and he started to walk. I come to get you for Sarah Ruth, Bryce said. You don't know Sarah Ruth. She's my sister, but she's sick. She had her baby doll made out of China and she loved that baby doll, but he broke it. He broke it and he stepped on that China doll's head and smashed it into a hundred million pieces. Them pieces was so small, I couldn't make them go back together. I couldn't. I tried and I tried. So new character, his sister, Sarah Ruth. Spelling that S-A-R-A-H R-U-T-H Sarah Ruth. At this point in his story, Bryce stopped walking and shook his head and wiped at his nose with the back of his hand. Sarah Ruth ain't had nothing to play with since. He won't buy her nothing. He says she don't need nothing. He says she just don't need nothing at all. But he don't know. Bryce started to walk again. He didn't know, he said. Who he was was not clear to Edward. What was clear was that he was being taken to a child to make up for the loss of a doll. A doll. How Edward loathed dolls. And to be thought of as a likely replacement for a doll offended him. But still, it was, he had to admit, a highly preferable alternative to hanging by his ears from a post. The house in which Bryce and Sarah Ruth lived 
was so small and crooked that Edward did not believe at first that it was a house. He mistook it instead for a chicken coop. Inside there were two beds and one kerosene lamp and not much else. Bryce laid Edward at the foot of one of the beds and then lit the lamp. Sarah, Bryce whispered, Sarah, Ruth, you got to wake up now, honey. I brung you something. And he took the harmonica out of his pocket and played the beginning of a simple melody. The little girl sat up in her bed and immediately started to cough. And Bryce put his hand on her back. That's all right, he told her. That's okay. She was young, maybe four years old, and she had white blonde hair. And even in the poor light of the lamp, Edward could see that her eyes were the same gold-flecked brown as Bryce's. That's right, said Bryce. You go on ahead and cough. And Sarah Ruth obliged him. She coughed and coughed and coughed. On the wall of the cabin, the kerosene light cast her trembling shadow, and she hunched over and was small. The coughing was the saddest sound that Edward had ever heard sadder even than the mournful call of the whippoorwill. Finally, Sarah Ruth stopped. Bryce said, you want to see what I brung you? Sarah Ruth nodded. You got to close your eyes. So the girl closed her eyes. Bryce picked up Edward and held him so that he was standing straight like a soldier at the end of the bed. All right now, you can open them. And Sarah Ruth opened her eyes and Bryce moved Edward's china legs and china arms so it looked as if he were dancing. Sarah Ruth laughed and clapped her hands. Rabbit, she said. He's for you, honey, said Bryce. Sarah Ruth looked first at Edward and then at Bryce and then back at Edward again and her eyes were wide and disbelieving. He's yours. Mine? Sarah Ruth, Edward was soon to discover, rarely said more than one word at a time. Words, at least several of them strung together, made her cough. So she limited herself. She said only what needed to be said. Yours, said Brace. I got him special for you. This knowledge provoked another fit of coughing in Sarah Ruth, and she hunched over again. When the fit was done, she uncurled herself and held out her arms. That's right, said Bryce, and he handed Edward to her. Baby, said Sarah Ruth, and she rocked Edward back and forth and stared down at him and smiled. Never in his life had Edward been cradled like a baby. Abilene had not done it, nor had Nellie, and most certainly Bull did not. It was a singular sensation to be held so gently and yet so fiercely to be stared down at with so much love. Edward felt the whole of his china body flood with warmth. You going to give him a name, honey? Bryce asked. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth, without taking her eyes off Edward. Jangles, huh? said Bryce. That's a good name. I like that name. So we'll stop there. Let's spell Jangles, capital J-A-N-G-L-E-S, just like it sounds, Jangles. I wonder what Edward thinks of that. Hush, she said to Edward as she rocked him back and forth. From the minute I first seen him, said Bryce, I knew he belonged to you. I said to myself, that rabbit is for Sarah Ruth for sure. Jangles, murmured Sarah Ruth. So here's the picture of the three of them together. There's Bryce on the harmonica, Sarah Ruth with Edward, or now Jangles, and she's really liking him, and she just loves him to death already. And um, Edward looks happy, or Jangles. Now you can see that Sarah Ruth looks a little bit sick in the picture. Her eyes are a little dark underneath, and she wasn't feeling very well, that's for sure. And that's the inside of the little shack. A couple of beds, and there's a chair I see, and nothing on the walls. See, it's pretty ba uh, plain, barren. Well, there's the kerosene lamp up there. That's the only light they would have had at nighttime. Outside the cabin, thunder cracked 
and then came the sound of rain falling on the tin roof. And Sarah Ruth rocked Edward back and forth, back and forth, and Bryce took out his harmonica and started to play, making his song keep rhythm with the rain. That's the end of chapter 17, everybody. Um, I hope you take some time to draw that or re-listen to this story, this part. That's three chapters. Next, after this is finished, um, you'll see carrying forward that the next other chapters will be coming, and it's more story about Bryce and Sarah and Jangles. Okay, so thanks for listening. Glad you were here, and we'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Hi, boys and girls. I hope the video is going. Okay. I think we're back, just trying to um, go through some technical difficulties here. All right, so we're back, uh, everybody, and uh, we last left off on chapter 17 when we have uh, Bryce and Sarah Ruth and Jangles now in the story. And uh, we know that they live in a little shack somewhere. They're not very rich, and the little boy doesn't have a very good grammar with him. And I know we all have our best grammar, so you can probably hear the difference. So let's carry on and let's see what happens in the next, um, I think it is, next three chapters again. So we're starting with chapter 18. Okay, ready? Here's the picture for chapter 18. Hmm. What do you see? I see a box with a lot of different buttons, a lot of different sizes. If it was in color, you would see probably lots of colored buttons, but black and white and different shades tells us that it's uh, probably very colorful buttons. But we aren't seeing color in this picture, in, these, uh, in this book, are we? All right, let's carry on, see what happens. So Bryce and Sarah Ruth had a father. Early the next morning, when the light was gray and uncertain, Sarah Ruth was sitting up in bed, coughing, and the father came home, probably from working a shift at night. He picked Edward up by one of his ears and said, I ain't never. It's a baby doll, said Bryce. Don't look like no baby doll to me. Edward, hanging by one ear, was frightened. This, he was certain, was the man who crushed the heads of China dolls. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth between coughs, and she held out her arms. He's hers, said Bryce. He belongs to her. The father dropped Edward on the bed, and Bryce picked up the rabbit and handed him to Sarah Ruth. It don't matter anyway, said the father. It don't make no difference, none of it. It does so matter, said Bryce. Don't you sass me, said the father, and he raised his hand, and then he turned and left the house. He doesn't sound like a very happy person, does he, boys and girls? No, I think, I think father has some um, happiness issues. You ain't got to worry about him, said Bryce to Edward. He ain't nothing but a bully. And besides, he don't hardly ever come home. Fortunately, the father did not come back that day, and Bryce went out to work, and Sarah Ruth spent the day in bed, holding Edward in her lap and playing with a box filled with buttons. Pretty, she said to Edward as she lined the buttons on the bed and arranged them into different patterns. <clears throat> Sometimes when a coughing fit was particularly bad, she squeezed Edward so tight that he was afraid he would crack in two. Also in between coughing fits, she took to sucking on one of the other of Edward's ears. Normally, Edward would have found that intrusive, clingy behavior very annoying, but there was something about Sarah Ruth he wanted to take care of her. He wanted to protect her. He wanted to do more for her. At the end of the day, Bryce returned with a biscuit for Sarah Ruth and a ball of twine for Edward. Sarah Ruth held the biscuit in both hands and took small tentative bites. You eat that all up now, honey. Let me hold Jangle, said Bryce. Him and me got a surprise for you. Bryce took Edward off in a corner of the room 
and with his pocket knife, he cut off lengths of twine, which is like a thick rope, and tied them to Edward's arms and feet, and then tied the twine to sticks of wood. See, all day I've been thinking about it, Bryce said. What we're going to do is make you dance. Sarah Ruth loves dancing. Mama used to hold on to her and dance her around the room. You eating that biscuit? Bryce called out to Sarah Ruth. Uh-huh, said Sarah Ruth. You hold on, honey. We got a surprise for you. And Bryce stood up. Close your eyes, he told her. And he took Edward over to the bed and said, Okay, you can open them now. And Sarah Ruth opened her eyes. Dance, Jangles, said Bryce. And then moving the strings with the sticks of his one hand, Bryce made Edward dance and drop and sway. And the whole while, at the same time with his other hand, he held on to the harmonica and played a bright and lively tune. So he's holding him kind of like a puppet on strings, like you know how you make a puppet dance on strings? That's what Bryce has made for Sarah Ruth to enjoy the dancing. Sarah Ruth laughed and she laughed until she started to cough. And then Bryce laid Edward down and took Sarah Ruth in his lap and rocked her and rubbed her back. You want some fresh air, he asked her. Let's get you out of this nasty old air, huh? And Bryce carried his sister outside. He left Edward lying on the bed, and the rabbit, staring up at the smoke-stained ceiling, thought again about having wings. If he had them, he thought, he would fly high above the world to where the air was clear and sweet, and he would take Sarah Ruth with him. He would carry her in his arms. Surely so high above the world, she would be able to breathe without coughing. After a minute, Bryce came back inside, still carrying Sarah Ruth. She wants you too, he said. Jangles, said Sarah Ruth, and she held out her arms. So Bryce held Sarah Ruth, and Sarah Ruth held Edward, and the three of them stood outside. Bryce said, you got to look for falling stars. Them are the ones with magic. They were quiet for a long time, all three of them looking up at the sky. Sarah Ruth stopped coughing, and Edward thought that maybe she had fallen asleep. There, she said, and she pointed to a star streaking through the night sky. Make a wish, honey, Bryce said. His voice was high and tight. That's your star. You make your wish for anything you want. And even though it was Sarah Ruth's star, Edward wished on it too. That's the end of chapter 18. Hmm, interesting. Here we're going to chapter 19. Now, what have we got there? Can you see what's happening? It's actually Edward, or Jangles, laying face down on the floor. You see all the twine that we talked about that was making him dance. And there, I see the bed there. Yeah. So there's Edward laying face down. Hmm. I wonder what happened. Well, let's find out. The days passed. The sun rose and set and rose and set again and again. Sometimes the father came home and sometimes he did not. Edward's ears became soggy and he did not care. His sweater had almost completely unraveled and it didn't bother him. He was hugged half to death and it felt good. In the evenings at the hands of Bryce, at the ends of the twine, Edward danced and danced. One month passed, and then two, and then three. Sarah Ruth got worse. In the fifth month, Sarah Ruth refused to eat. And in the sixth month, she began to cough harder. Her breathing became ragged and uncertain, as if she was trying to remember in between breaths what to do what breathing was like. Breathe, honey, Bryce stood over her and said. Breathe, thought Edward, from deep inside the well of her arms. Please, please, breathe. Bryce stopped leaving the house. He sat at home all day and held Sarah Ruth in his lap and rocked her back and forth and sang to her. On a bright morning in September, Sarah Ruth, stopped breathing. Hmm. 
Oh, no, said Bryce. Oh, honey, take a little breath, please. Edward had fallen out of Sarah Ruth's arms, and she had not asked for him again. So face down on the floor, arms over his head, Edward listened as Bryce cried. He listened as the father came home and shouted at Bryce. Then he listened as the father wept. You can't cry, Bryce shouted. You got no right to cry. You never even loved her. You don't know nothing about love. I loved her, said the father. I did love her. I loved her too, thought Edward. I loved her and now she is gone. How could this be, he wondered. How could he bear to live in a world without Sarah Ruth? The yelling between the father and son continued and then there was a terrible moment when the father insisted that Sarah Ruth belonged to him, that she was his girl, his baby, and that he was taking her to be buried. She ain't yours, Bryce screamed. You ain't taking her, she ain't yours. But the father was bigger and stronger. He wrapped Sarah Ruth in a blanket and carried her away. The small house became very quiet. Edward could hear Bryce moving around, muttering to himself. And then finally, the boy picked Edward up. Come on, Jangles, Bryce said. We're leaving. We're going to Memphis. And here's the picture of Bryce and Edward leaving. So that was a pretty sad chapter. And um, if we were in class, guys, then at this point, I would stop and talk to you about what happened to Sarah Ruth. Pretty sad. Bryce loved her so much. And so did Jangles. He loved her just as much. And she had trouble with breathing. And she just stopped. And, um, and I know some of us might be feeling pretty teary. So I always have Kleenex ready for this part of the book. And if you have some Kleenex, you can stop. And, and you can just take a minute to yourself and think, Oh my, that was very sad. Mm-hmm. And now we would come to the carpet as a class and we would sit together and we would just talk about what made us sad there. And if you're feeling sad and, and if you're not sure what you're feeling right now, I know that you think that this is a sad situation for Sarah Ruth and Bryce and Jangles and it's okay to be sad. It's absolutely okay. Because when we lose somebody that's close to us, it makes us sad. And in our story, it made Bryce and Jangles very sad. And the father was also very sad. And um, it's, it's okay to cry. And now that we talk about it, and I, I actually let your mom and dad know ahead of time. So if they're sitting beside you right now, they might be giving you a cuddle. Or they stopped and they're talking to you about this. Because it's important for you to know that it's okay. This is a fiction story, and fiction is not real. And yet, we know that in the world, this does happen sometimes. And so, I just wanted mom and dad to be close by when we read this chapter. And so, you can have a talk about it together. You can hug together. Share some, share some Kleenex together, because I certainly needed mine too. It's really hard to keep reading, because I'm so sad with that. But we know it's just going to carry on and Edward's going to carry on in this journey. So when you're ready, we have one more chapter to read through for this week. And you'll see another um, adventure for Edward going to start. Okay, so we say goodbye to Sarah Ruth and we move on with Bryce and Jangles or Malone. and uh, Or Edward, I mean, <laughs> Jangles and Edward. And... Um, and we carry on from here. If you have any questions, check in with mom and dad. It's okay. Okay. And at school, if we could, we would have a big hug together. Okay. So here we go. Let's pick up our next, our next um, sequence. And if you're ready, and maybe you might take a, a break and come back and read this last chapter with me. Okay. All right. So if you've paused and you've come back, welcome back. I hope you feel better. 
So we're moving on now to our last chapter for this week is chapter 20. Take a look at Jangles. Hmm, he's upright now and he's on his twine like a puppet. Hmm. So we last saw Bryce and Jangles going down the road together and they were going to Memphis. That's a big city in one of the states in, in America. And so Memphis, you'll hear, it's a big city. All right, let's carry on. Ready? How many dancing rabbits have you seen in your life? Bryce said to Edward, I can tell you how many I've seen. One, you. That's how you and me are going to make some money. I seen it the last time I was in Memphis. Folks put on any kind of show right there on the street corner and people pay them for it. I seen it. The walk to town took all night. Bryce walked without stopping, carrying Edward under one arm and talking to him the whole time. Edward tried to listen, but the terrible scarecrow feeling had come back. The feeling he had when he was hanging by his ears in the old lady's garden. The feeling that nothing mattered and that nothing would ever matter again. And not only did Edward feel hollow, he ached. Every part of his china body hurt. He ached for Sarah Ruth. He wanted her to hold him. He wanted to dance for her. And he did dance, but it was not for Sarah Ruth. Edward danced for strangers on a dirty street corner in Memphis. Bryce played his harmonica and moved Edward's strings and Edward bowed and shuffled and swayed and people stopped to stare and point and laugh. On the ground in front of them was Sarah Ruth's button box. The lid was open to encourage people to drop change inside. Mama, said a small child, look at that bunny. I want to touch him. He reached out his hand for Edward. No, said the mother, dirty. And she pulled the child back and away from Edward. Nasty, she said. A man wearing a hat stopped and stared at Edward and Bryce. It's a sin to dance, he said. And then after a long pause, he said, it's a particular sin for rabbits to dance. The man took off his hat and held it over his heart. He stood and watched the boy and the rabbit for a long time. Finally, he put his hat back on his head and he walked away. The shadows lengthened. The sun became an orange, dusty ball low in the sky. Bryce started to cry. Edward saw his tears land on the pavement. But the boy did not stop playing his harmonica. He did not make Edward stop dancing. An old woman leaning on a cane stepped up close to them. He stared at Edward with deep, dark eyes. Guess who he was thinking of? Pellegrina, thought the dancing rabbit. She nodded at him. Look at me, he said to her. His arms and legs were jerking. Look at me, you got your wish. I have learned how to love. And it's a terrible thing. I'm broken. My heart is broken. Help me. The old woman turned and hobbled away. Come back, thought Edward. Fix me. Bryce cried harder. He made Edward dance faster. Finally, when the sun was gone and the streets were dark, Bryce stopped playing his harmonica. I'm done now, he said. And he let Edward fall to the pavement. I ain't gonna cry no more. Bryce wiped his nose and his eyes with the back of his hand. He picked up the button box and looked inside it. We got us enough money to get something to eat, he said. Come on, Jangles. So he was trying to make some money. And in our day, we call that busking. And you might see that in the summertime on the streets in Vancouver. And it's where talented people play a guitar or they sing or play a violin. And people will put a dollar or so into their case. And that's for people to make money. And so that is what Bryce was trying to do too, because now he doesn't have his home anymore. So he's looking for money and he's working. He came up with a plan and he made the plan happen and he got some money. So they're gonna, come on Jangles was his last, go get something to eat. So I wonder what's gonna happen next. Stay tuned and for next week. Now for this week, uh, be prepared to answer some questions about our six chapters that we read and we went through a lot today and so or if you're watching this over two days that's great or sometimes you might watch it all at once but make sure you keep your character names in your sequencing board
and then you can refer back to those when I ask you the questions. Okay, so bye for now, and we'll see you next time on the Edward journey. Okay, bye.